there's some bits of the philosophic enterprise that I think can be taught and some bits that can't. I mean, I think we can teach uh, any reasonably intelligent person to be a professional philosopher. You can learn the history, the literature, the language, the distinctions, uh, and come to be able to make moves in the contemporary literature in a uh, professionally responsible way. I don't think uh, we can teach people to do transformational uh, philosophy, but I think that you can learn that. And I think the way you learn it is by focusing on examples of it. Uh, you just have to have before your mind uh, examples of philosophical transformations and uh, you know, assemble as many of those uh, of the highest uh, caliber as you can and, okay, that's what you want to do. It's not going to be, you know, the same move, but to do that, whatever that, that was for uh, some tradition, some problem. Uh, and this uh, essay, Empiricism and Philosophy of Mind, is a paradigm uh, of that. Uh, I think the absolute core of it is the account of Luke's talk uh, that he gives. Um, the, the essay is also um, replete with um, philosophical suggestions and ideas, some of which he follows up elsewhere, some of which he doesn't. Um, Overall, I think there's a real danger of losing the forest uh, for the trees. Uh, people have found this a very difficult uh, essay to read. It's not very well written. Um, William James described um, listening to Peirce give a lecture as um, flashes of intense brilliance relieved against Chimerian darkness. And I think that's the sense uh, one gets in reading this. Uh, there is uh, a narrative line to it. It's basically in two halves. Uh, the first one centering around uh, the myth of the given uh, in epistemology, and the second focusing on his account of inner episodes in the philosophy of mind. Uh, there is a rationale tying those together. It's a unified uh, project. But there's also all kinds of other stuff that he throws in that distract from uh, the narrative line. There's uh, a bunch of historical remarks uh, early on. His entire discussion of semantics uh, early on could be excised from uh, the essay without uh, any loss. It was, well, something important he had to say, so he said it. And that's not uh, a good narrative strategy uh, uh, in general. Uh, so although people uh, uh, knew this essay was very important, I mean, right from the beginning, this was uh, when Sellers made his name, was giving these three lectures at the University of London in uh, 56. Uh, we have the list, I think, in the miscellaneous Solarziana folder in the, uh, on the website. I put, I think, a list of the British philosophers who came to hear him, uh, and it's really, you know, it's a who's who. Lyle, Ayer, Strawson, um, uh, so they, they all came. And their view was they had finally discovered that there was important philosophy being done in America. And you know, Sellers was doing it. Um, that, that was just from, from listening to these lectures. Uh, on the other hand, people found it very hard to sort of boil down uh, what the point was. Uh, I have for many years taught this essay in my undergraduate philosophy of mind class, which many people think is just bonkers. Uh, but I do it by uh, resolutely stripping it down to uh, the, the main points. And as I say that the high point that I want to talk about today is the account of Luke's talk. But I think in order to appreciate what a stupendous move uh, he's making, uh, the huge uh, 
uh, transformation in our uh, thinking about these things that he makes possible, we need to, to do some background uh, for it. And so that, that's what I hope to uh, present to you. So the first thing, let me uh, rush through a canned story about epistemological foundationalism. Uh, I expect almost all of this will be old hat to you, but uh, I assume infinite intelligence and zero pre previous knowledge of um, what's going on here, I believe, in making it explicit. So let me uh, hit these high points. And if something is going by too fast, um, uh, I can uh, stop me and I can slow down. So uh, epistemology starts off with the JTB, Justified True Belief, uh, account of knowledge uh, that uh, people at least pin on Plato uh, uh, with uh, it's controversial with what justice. Uh, Gettier notoriously uh, argues that justified true belief is those three conditions are not sufficient for knowledge. Uh, he doesn't contest that they're necessary conditions. Gettier cases uh, spawned uh, uh, a cottage industry of trying to formulate a fourth, uh, a fourth condition. Uh, that came to be known as Gettierology and pretty much killed off epistemology as an interesting uh, philosophical discipline uh, for uh, a good decade afterwards. Uh, but if we think about the structure of justification, the claim is it's only justified beliefs that are candidates for being knowledge, uh, and we think about the process of justifying a claim, uh, it seems that whatever you do to justify a claim, uh, giving reasons for it, uh, is only going to work if the claims you make in giving the reasons and giving the justification are themselves justified. And then it seems like there's three possible structures that the justification of a claim could have. Uh, you justify P by appeal to Q. Uh, we ask, well, but how are you justified in Q? And you appeal to R. Uh, first possibility is that process just goes on forever. Uh, you, you never get to anything about which it isn't appropriate to ask in turn, what's your justification for that? Second possibility is uh, you find yourself going around in circles, that uh, you appeal to things that already were already came up in this uh, justificatory process. Uh, and the final one is that at some point you get to uh, unjustified justifiers. Um, you get to a foundation, things that can justify other claims but don't themselves stand in need of justification in order to do that. Here we might distinguish uh, besides the process of justifying by giving reasons, some notion of positive justificatory status. And the foundationalist idea is that uh, there could be claims that have positive justificatory status, even though they didn't get it by inheriting it from some others by a process of being justified. Uh, so uh, the first alternative, you never get to any claim uh, whose justification could be inherited by all of them, uh, leads to a kind of skepticism, regressive uh, skepticism. It curls back on itself. Well, uh, one either thinks that's a defective uh, uh, kind of justification and is a skeptic, or has some sort of coherence view about how uh, the justification works. And the other alternative is uh, foundationalism. So this has come to be called the Agrippan trilemma. A trilemma rather than a dilemma, because there's three alternatives rather than two. Uh, and I, I think this goes back to Sextus Empiricus, who uh, attributed this uh, set of alternatives uh, to Agrippa the skeptic and said he'd learned about it from Diogenes Laertius, because uh, he had, because Sextus had not actually read 
Agrippa himself. That's how those. Um, uh, <clears throat> that's how those texts worked. Um, okay, and people played around uh, within this structure. One of the important things to realize, uh, I think, is that uh, it's one thing to say that every chain of justification going backwards ends somewhere. Uh, you get to a point where your spade is turned, as uh, Wittgenstein uh, says, I'll say parenthetically, uh, John McDowell has always refused to have his picture on any of his books. Uh, it's uh, some deep felt principle of him, uh, of his, uh, I have desperately tried to persuade him uh, against that in various ways, and he finally said, well, the only one that he would uh, consider putting uh, on there was a picture of him in the garden with his spade being turned. That, uh, that was what he could, he, he could imagine. It's one thing to say every chain of justification ends somewhere. Uh, it's something else to say. It's a much more committive claim to say, there's a kind of claim. There is somewhere where chains of justification end. That is, there's a kind of claim that are the unjustified justifiers. Um, that's a difference of quantifier scope. The one says for every inquiry, there is some bottoming out, some claim that um, uh, ends the regress of justification. The other one is saying there is some kind of claim such that for every inquiry, if you push hard enough, you'll end up with one of those uh, kinds of, with a, with a claim of one of the, uh, of that kind. Okay. Uh, people realized that uh, in parallel to that uh, potential regress of prem on the side of premises, uh, there was a uh, orthogonal uh, threat of a regress on justifying the inferences. So uh, I'm trying to justify P and I appeal to Q. I say Q, therefore P. And you say, well, why should I believe in that therefore? To justify that inference for me. And I say, oh, well, that follows from uh, R, that that's a good inference. And now you could pursue R, but you also could say, well, I don't see that. Tell me why. Um, uh, uh, tell me about this inference from R to the goodness of the inference from Q to P. Uh, these uh, correspond, uh, sorry, uh, it was of the essence of logical empiricism to see regress stoppers of a foundationalist kind for both of these kinds of regresses. On the side of premises, it was uh, experiences. Uh, whatever the, uh, however the empiricism of the day considered them, uh, in, in his uh, uh, version of the Aufbau, uh, well, I mean, Carnap uses those in uh, his Aufbau, and Nelson Goodman in The Structure of Appearance, uh, there was a rewriting of his Harvard dissertation. Uh, he calls these experience erlebs, after the German word erlebnis, uh, which we should contra which means sort of self-intimating episode, um, which we should contrast with experience in the sense of Erfahrung. That's the um, uh, Hegelian and Deweyan sense of experience. Always had three years' experience as a chef. Uh, he's not talking about how he's lit up inside. But the airlabs uh, were thought of as the regress stoppers on the side of premises, that eventually you would come back to some sort of sense certainty, in Hegel's term for that. And the thought was uh, the regress stoppers on the side of inference are you unpack the goodness of the inference until you get to logically good uh, inferences. And that's something that we uh, talked about last time. Well, how does that unpacking go? Well, the thought is it goes by the meanings of the words, that the words have meanings uh, that are a combination of 
the air labs, the experiences that would, say, verify them, and the logical elaboration uh, of those. So the thought was that analyticity plus logic would stop the regress on the side of the inferences uh, and uh, air labs uh, experiences would stop the regress on the side of premises. And that was pretty much the uh, project of logical empiricism as Carnap conceived it in the Aufbau. Uh, those correspond, uh, not coincidentally, to Kantian intuitions and concepts, uh, at least to a conception, uh, to a conception of those. And foundationalism was uh, uh, the dominant epistemological view for most of the 20th century in Anglophone uh, philosophy. Uh, Rorty, in his book about foundationalism, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, blames it on Kant, but says really it goes back to Descartes' uh, introduction of the idea of representation. And because foundationalism is a bad thing to worry about, uh, we should give up the a Cartesian notion of representation. I'm actually going to say something about that uh, in a little bit. Um, but uh, in uh, the middle of the century, in the early 50s, uh, Sellers dismantled uh, the notion of sensory givenness as a regress stopper in empiricism and the philosophy of mind and Quine dismantled appealing to analyticity and logic in first truth by uh, convention and then uh, two dogmas of empiricism. Uh, it, each of them from what's recognizable as a broadly pragmatist uh, uh, form of argumentation uh, and each of them taking uh, uh, each of them arguing that the epistemological foundationalism presupposed a semantic foundationalism, uh, presupposed that you could uh, translate or analyze uh, the meanings of empirical claims without remainder into an experiential component and a logical or uh, meaning, transparent meaning uh, component. Uh, meanings thought of as something that you understand just by having them transparent in the way that uh, the sensory, in a way that's analogous to uh, the sensory uh, givenness. And each of them attacked that semantic foundationalism with a kind of semantic holist uh, argument. Uh, this, this is the story that uh, pretty much that Rorty tells in Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Uh, it's distilled down into a particularly clear uh, form by his student Mike Williams in his book, uh, Groundless Belief. So if you look, sort of see that take on things, uh, Mike Williams' book uh, is the place to go. Um, so that that's a framework. Sellers is, um, responsible. John Austin gets a, uh, an honorable mention here with dismantling the notion of the sensory given on which epistemological foundationalism depends. And to a first approximation, there haven't been any epistemological foundationalists since uh, their critiques uh, really uh, became well known in the 60s. Uh, epistemology was displaced then by philosophy of science, and it's only been relatively recently that uh, a more formal epistemology has come back and been thought uh, actually to be of any interest because uh, epistemology and issues of foundationalism were just sort of the same, the same thing. And when people realized that was a bad idea, uh, it, it, it wasn't clear what form epistemology could take anymore. So there actually was a big sociological effect uh, of this. Okay, before 
uh, uh, getting to the main event, the discussion of uh, Luke's talk. Uh, let me talk about what happens in the, in the first section of um, EPM. Uh, it's entitled An Ambiguity in Sense Data Theories. Uh, and mostly it's an assembly of considerations and distinctions that leads to a, a plausible diagnosis of what's, been wrong, of what's wrong with uh, the notion of givenness. Um, he starts off with what elsewhere, uh, with reminding us of what elsewhere he refers to as the notorious ing ed ambiguity. I mentioned this uh, before. Here with the notion of sensation. Uh, and says, look, it's going to be absolutely crucial that we distinguish between an act of sensing and something that is sensed. Uh, that's the ing in sensing and the ed in uh, sensed. Uh, he thinks of that as an act content uh, distinction. And let me remind you, uh, uh, he's the one who taught us to be uh, so uh, careful whenever we're uh, faced with a philosophical term that is subject to this notorious ing ed uh, ambiguity. Justification is, I was just talking about uh, the distinction between the process of justifying and the status of being justified, uh, that uh, it's important to distinguish that. But perception is like that, experience uh, uh, is like that. Uh, many philosophical concepts uh, have this ambiguity, and you should always uh, translate each occurrence into an explicit ing or ed. Uh, the T I O N in English that almost always has this uh, has this ambiguity uh, invites you to make slides of the sort that. Uh, uh, notoriously result in Marklean idealism. If you say, look, all of our, all of our knowing is or is based on perceiving uh, and end up thinking that uh, the only thing that can be perceived is perceivings uh, because you're not systematically distinguish, distinguishing these things. You think of experience uh, and you say, well, everything we know is through uh, experience. Uh, if you identify that as experiencing and say, well, but, you know, what experience is, is of experience. Um, okay, so he warns us of that. Um, and then uh, we can pick up uh, in the quotations here in section three. Uh, he said um, uh, in this First sentence, the point of the epistemological category of the given is, presumably, to explicate the idea that empirical knowledge rests on a foundation of non-inferential knowledge of matters of fact. So that, that's why I went through you know, telling us it is within a foundationalist uh, framework that uh, these issues arise. Uh, but given that, we may well feel us experience a feeling of surprise on noting that according to sense datum theorists, so that's one form of givenness. He's going to start with that and generalize to <coughs> others. It's particulars that sense. Uh, so this particular sense impression of a red triangle is the object of the sensing. Uh, for what is known, even in non-inferential observational knowledge is facts rather than particulars. Items of the form, something's being thus and so, or something standing in a certain relation to something else. It would seem then that the sensing of sense contents, there he's carefully making a distinction, cannot constitute knowledge, inferential or non-inferential. And if so, we may well ask, what light does the concept of a sense datum throw on the foundations of empirical knowledge? 
it seems like the sense datum theorist has to choose between saying it's particulars which are sensed, but then sensing is not knowledge. The existence of sense data, the existence of these sensed sense contents doesn't logically imply the existence of knowledge. There's got to be some step to get to knowing something. Or sensing is a form of knowing, uh, but then it's facts rather than particulars that are uh, sensed. Um, here, uh, he's invoking the distinction, sort of the second distinction of the essay, the first thing he had, uh, between what's expressed by sentences and what's referred to by singular terms. Um, and what, one of the uh, reasons one can find a notion of representation objectionable is that it can invite you to run these together and think of the relation between the declarative sentence and what it expresses uh, on the one hand and the singular term and what it refers to as both being representations, thinking the sentence is representing a fact in the same sense of representation in which a singular term like John represents the object John. Uh, and th this consideration does not militate against crafting a notion of representation that could be applied in both cases. Uh, but, you, but it is reminding us that you don't get it for free. Uh, sentences are not singular terms and objects are not facts. Uh, it's uh, interesting here parenthetically and uh, Sellers who wrote this for his English audience uh, certainly uh, expected everyone in the audience to know that in 1950s, Rawson had written an influential article criticizing John Austin uh, for talking about facts, uh, which uh, Strawson thought uh, someone who claimed to be uh, anti-theoretical and guided by ordinary language should not, uh, that facts were, in Strawson's memorable phrase, sentence-shaped objects and that only someone in the grip of a philosophical theory would postulate the existence uh, of such things. So Sellers is here reminding us of this distinction and pointing out that it uh, creates a dilemma, at least, for uh, a sense datum theorist. They have their sort of conception of what sense the content is of something particular, uh, uh, red triangle, uh, something red and triangular. Uh, on the other hand, if these are to be epistemological foundation foundations, uh, they have to be able to stand in evidential relations with claimables, with sentences. Uh, and what can do that in the first instance is other stuff that can express knowledge, that is, uh, things that would be expressed by declarative sentences. So he, he's pointing out well, an ambiguity in uh, sense datum theorists that they're pulled in two directions in the conception of uh, the sensuous given. But, uh, well, okay, he throws in here a consideration that will be uh, very important later on about the difference between what's expressed by uh, declarative sentences that can be the expression of knowledge, epistemic states, and mere reference to objects in the world. He says in five, this is the second passage, the idea that epistemic facts can be analyzed without remainder into non-epistemic facts. So an epistemic fact about what somebody knows being uh, uh, analyzable without remainder into facts that don't involve knowledge uh, is a radical mistake, he says, a mistake of a piece with the naturalistic fallacy in ethics. Uh, 
I mean, we won't understand this until we get to section 36. Uh, I mean, you've seen that passage before because that's the index passage of uh, the left wing, uh, the left wing Solarsians, and it's. Um, over on page five of the uh, handout. The essential point is that in characterizing an episode or a state as one of knowing epistemic fact, we're not giving an empirical description of that episode or state, replacing it in the logical space of reasons of justifying and being able to justify what one says. We're giving a normative characterization of it. Uh, that, that's, he, he's just registering here that that's going to be important later on. Again, distracting. When it's important later on, tell us that it's uh, important. Don't put it on the table here. Um, but uh, whether, at, at the end of five, still on the handout, whether classical sense datum philosophers have conceived of the givenness of sense contents is analyzable in non-epistemic terms, or is constituted by acts which are somehow irreducible and knowings, so they have sort of both characterizations, they have without exception taken them to be fundamental in another sense. And this is where his argument is really gonna to begin to get a grip. For they have taken givenness to be a fact that presupposes no learning, no forming of associations, no setting up of stimulus response connections. Uh, in particular, the one that he cares about is uh, you don't have to learn any concepts in order to have, uh, in order to be able to sense sense contents. That's the uh, idea. That's what you come with, so that by abstraction, association, or whatever, you can come to acquire concepts. Uh, that's the picture. Um, but that already, apart from this consideration epistemic, non-epistemic, and apart from the consideration uh, uh, whether it's particulars or facts uh, that we're talking about, just this fact that they're thinking about it as a foundation for knowledge and uh, as a capacity that is unacquired sets up an inconsistent triad of commitments. Uh, they're confronted by this inconsistent triad made up of the following three propositions. X senses a red sense content S and tails X non-inferentially knows that S is red. So having the given uh, entails knowing something. Uh, then that thing that you know, that at least the sense content is red, that's going to be the one that is the uh, unjustified justifier, the thing that has positive justificatory status because it's grounded in uh, the sensing of the sense content, but then can serve as a premise for getting knowledge. So that's sort of the function that this given has to perform. B, the ability to sense sense contents is unacquired. That's what the little kids have got. Uh, they don't know that red is what it is and triangular is what it is, but they can still have those sense impressions. That's the, uh, the thought. And uh, so can your cat, um, probably. I can never remember whether it's cats that are colorblind and dogs are not. Or that one of the, I believe that one is and one isn't, but I don't remember which it is. Uh, and C, the ability to know facts of the form X is phi, uh, for instance, that S is red, are acquired. If you know that X is red, uh, inferentially or non-inferentially, uh, well, you have to have learned what red things are. Uh, to, to have that bit of knowledge. And he says, look, these are, uh, you can have any two of these, but uh, you can't have all three 
uh, of these. They're incompatible. Um, having talked about not doing distracting asides, I can't resist uh, here, so hold, hold this thought. Uh, Sellers very often argues from inconsistent triads uh, uh, like this. Uh, there's nothing sort of mysterious about them conceptually. You know, P, if P, then Q, and not Q are an inconsistent, an irreducibly inconsistent triad. You can have any two of them, but uh, not all three of them. Uh, but Sellers generalized this uh, in, into what's uh, come to be called Sellers Challenge. And I think there's a Wikipedia page uh, about this. Uh, but that people have worried about who don't know who Sellers is. And this was the question whether there are perceptual uh, inconsistent triads. And in particular, the case that he thought was challenging was taste. That is, set the standard of tasting okay, tasting bad, wherever you like. Are there any three things such that any two of them together taste okay, but all three of them are disgusting. Uh, by any standard of okay and disgusting, however you draw that line, but it has to be sort of plausibly the same line that you're drawing for uh, those three things. At the uh, uh, meeting of all the Sellers freaks in Dublin on the uh, 100th anniversary of his birth in uh, 2012, uh, we had various candidates who went around to tables and tried various things that people had suggested uh, for this. I won't uh, go into any of them except to say, uh, so far, as far as I know, the, the winning candidate for uh, a Salarsian perceptual inconsistent triad is whiskey, beer, and lemonade. Uh, whiskey and beer is a boiler maker, and people drink those. Uh, beer and lemonade is a shandy, and people drink those. Uh, whiskey and lemonade is a whiskey sour, and people drink those. But nobody drinks all three, and uh, they're not good. <laughs> um, at any rate, that's the current uh, winner. That's a taste, but it's on the drink side. What about foods? This, you know, for the cooks and chefs in your community, you can think about this. But it, it is uh, even conceptually more challenging in the perceptual range than it is conceptually. So anyway, this was Sellers in his time off worried about that, uh, worried about that kind of thing. But, I can't read this uh, initial inconsistent triad without being reminded, um, reminded of that uh, issue. OK, end of that uh, distraction. Uh, so he says, once the classical sense datum theorist faces up to the fact that A, B, and C do form an inconsistent triad, which of them will he choose to abandon? If he gives up A, that sensing a sense a sense content S, a red sense content S entails not inferentially knowing that S is red. Uh, so the sensing of sense contents becomes a non-cognitive, non-epistemic fact. It may be a necessary condition of having knowledge, but it doesn't, const it doesn't constitute knowledge. Uh, you can give that up, but that's giving up the foundational role of the sensing. Now you've got to say something about uh, what the relationship is between the sensing of a sense content and knowing anything. Uh, and um, invoking the notion of the given was supposed to get you that. He can ab abandon B, the ability to sense sense contents is unacquired, uh, but then it's cut off from our ordinary talk about sensations, after images, tickles, itches, and so on, the sort of thing that you think you can share with your cat that the, that the uh, pre-linguistic infant has, uh, and so on. So what are these things that uh, one is talking about? 
Um, or you could give up C, the idea that to know facts of the form X is phi is acquired. Uh, but no sort of broadly empiricist one wants to have innate knowledge like that, particularly innate knowledge that we're going to use to base all of our empirical uh, knowledge of contingent uh, things on. So uh, uh, he says the diagnosis in seven, uh, and this is um, on page, top of page two in the handout, it certainly begins to look as though the classical concept of a sense datum were a mongrel resort, resulting from the crossbreeding of two ideas. And the idea is, each of these ideas is fine by itself, but they're different ideas, don't run them together. And the first is that there's certain inner episodes, say sensations of red or of C-sharp, which can occur to human beings and brutes without any prior process of learning or concept formation, and without which it would in some sense be impossible to see, for example, that the facing surface of a physical object is red and triangular, or hear that a certain physical sound is a C sharp. So that's what blind or colorblind people don't have, is these inner episodes. Um, um, the other idea, that there are certain inner episodes which are non-inferential knowings that certain items are, for example, red or C-sharp, and that those episodes are the necessary conditions of empirical knowledge as providing the evidence for all other empirical propositions. And he wants to say that that's an OK idea. There's a sense in which he's going to endorse both of these claims. But he's pointing out, his diagnosis is, uh, you're talking about different kinds of things. The, the things under one are particulars. Uh, the capacity to have them is unacquired. Uh, they don't involve uh, applying concepts. And they're not, by themselves, knowledge. They're non-epistemic occurrences. Uh, the other ones. Uh, you do have to have concepts to, to have. They do constitute knowledge. You do have to acquire the concepts to have them. And they're expressed by sentences, not by uh, singular terms. So this is, uh, he, he's laid out some distinctions and pointed out that uh, fans of the sensory given in the classical form of sense datum theorists are trying to have things both ways. Uh, and it, it looks as though they're just confusing these two, uh, these two kinds of things. Yeah. So if there's a child and it goes around the world and it can see all the red things and all the triangular things, and then it walks into the classroom and all of a sudden it, the teacher teaches it about triangular things and red things and what it, and, and what it means to be those things and how to identify them, is the sense theorist trying to say, well, the child can all of a sudden just go back into its pre, uh, preconceptual knowledge of, of, of triangular and red things and all of a sudden kind of see that it already knew that it had that well, knowledge? I mean, he, he comes explicitly to worry, to worry about this uh, uh, around 20, section uh, 22. And I'd rather... Oh, wait to say how he's thinking about it. Uh, he's saying, look, this is going to be really a problem for sense datum theorists or classical empiricists who you know, have got to build knowledge at least of what's going on in your mind. Um, but you know, that you are seeing something red and triangular out of uh, sort of picture-like things, particulars. Uh, and you know, this is this is the challenge. Yeah, Tom. Is this supposed to be a place, or is this a place in which his sort of strong Kantian, uh, I don't know, whatever influences manifest this idea between? I can get a sense with where one is talking about 
the matter from an intuition, and two is bringing in concepts and the understanding. Yeah, and and, and uh, you know the the Kantian idea that um, the I mean this is the caricature, but the the empiricists uh, were trying to think of one kind of thing, one uh, dimension that had sensuous intuitions at the bottom and concepts at the top. So they were thinking of concepts as just a kind of abstract or general uh, sensation. And the rationalists were trying to think of sensations as confused ideas, concepts uh, coming down the other way, saying, look, these are different, uh, these are different things, and you're trying to have it, uh, you're trying to have it both ways. Now, we can already see the glimmerings of uh, the more general critique of givenness that goes beyond the sense datum uh, people. It's going to be a critique of the idea of some event or episode, some occurrence uh, that itself is non-conceptual in, in its content and so doesn't uh, require you to have mastered, to have learned to use all the concepts and so on that, that get expressed uh, linguistically, but that constitutes some kind of knowledge, at least in that it can provide, it can serve as evidence for uh, claims. Uh, that, that's an epistemic matter, he's going to argue, it's a normative matter. Uh, anybody who thinks there's a kind of event uh, that is itself uh, independent of any conceptual articulation, but that can provide evidence for the application of concepts. That's the key uh, that all the different versions, he'll call versions of givenness, have got in common. Okay. Uh, so now we get to mm, the main event. Um, um, in Seller's text, one should skip from section 7 to section 14. Uh, he goes off to talk about stuff that is interesting after you know sort of what he's doing in uh, the argument, but really uh, is not uh, advancing his argument. Uh, he really instead of asking you know, of each object in your apartment whether it sparks joy and if not getting rid of it, in your narrative ask of each piece of it how it's advancing the argument. Uh, and if it's not, if it's just true and important and interesting, not good enough, get it out of uh, my narrative. Thank you, my narrative. Uh, <laughs> demands this. Okay. So here's a background for why uh, we should talk about what's expressed by talking about how things look, seem, or appear. Uh, we've been talking about sense data, and there's sort of a connection between those, but uh, basically, and I should say, the chit chat in between 7 and 14 does something to say articulate something about the connection between these so it doesn't seem like just uh, a jump. But I want to, I want to bring uh, the background I, I want to uh, uh, invoke here is, or supply here, is uh, in the foundationalist uh, program, how uh, appearances uh, can matter. So uh, suppose you are uh, an epistemological foundationalist. You're looking for those unjustified justifiers. Here are two Cartesian lines of thought. Exactly what relation they bear to anything Descartes actually said is controversial. But I think these are lines of thought he had. I think these orient his uh, Way back in the beginning uh, of this course, the first session, I talked about 
Descartes' invention of the notion of representation as a more abstract way of thinking about the relations between appearance and reality than the resemblance picture that uh, uh, were essentially universal uh, before him. Uh, he needed it in order to think about the new science to understand uh, Galileo and then his own uh, innovations. And uh, his analytic geometry, the isomorphism between algebra and geometry was the paradigm they claimed of uh, this more abstract kind of representation. But implicit in Descartes uh, with his notion of uh, the world as dividing into things that are by nature representings, uh, are tanquam rem, he says, as if of things, uh, and things that are only fit to be represented, uh, things that are not themselves minds, uh, is an epistemic theory that says what knowledge consists in is having a good representation. Uh, knowledge is a relation between, and now sensitive as we are to the inged ambiguity, we'll say, uh, a relation between representings and representeds uh, of the sort, the paradigm of which is uh, having an equation that describes uh, the extended shape or the motion of an object, uh, the way Descartes can now do for uh, Galileo's um, dynamics. Uh, so you know about things in the world by representing them. But how do you know about the representings? If you know about them representationally, that is, you know about the pen there by representing it. It's represented, and I have a representing of it. But how do I know about my representing? If I know about that, my representing representationally, that is, by having a representing of it, then we have a regress. And the question is, where is that? You know, what's going to stop that? Well, he says, the, it's going to be stopped by something that you can know non-representationally. Uh, that you can know not by representing it, but just by having it. So he thinks, if we know about stuff out there in the world by representing them, there must be something, some representings, that we know about non-representationally immediately not by representing them, where the representing mediates between the represented thing we know about and us, but immediately, just by having them. We could say things that represent themselves, uh, but that isn't really the important feature of them. It's that the mere occurrence of the representing is a knowing of that representing, it's a non-representational knowing. That is what Descartes realized is that if anything is to be knowable representationally, something must be knowable non-representationally, namely some representings. And he called those things pensées, thoughts, uh, and said these are occurrences, the, the, these are episodes, events, the mere occurrence of which counts as knowing that they occur. That's a notion of awareness of a kind of self-intimating episode uh, about which we're incorrigible epistemologically. We can't be mistaken. Uh, if you think you have one of those, then you do. Uh, and they're transparent to us. Uh, if you have one, you know that you have it. So it has these two uh, epistemic features. Uh, you can't make mistakes about them, and you can't be ignorant uh, about them. You're incorrigible, and they're transparent. Uh, 
Um, just the occurrence of it uh, is a knowing that it occurs, and it's a knowing of everything about what it, what it occurs. That was the, the Cartesian idea of a pensée, and he basically transcendentally deduced the existence of those things. There have to be things like that if the way that we know about things in the world is representationally. There must be something that you know about and know all about non-representationally just by its occurring. <coughs> okay, that's one line of thought. Uh, a second line of thought that he has is, well, I'm thinking about representation and one of the things that uh, thinking about representational knowledge makes intelligible is the possibility of error. Uh, error is misrepresentation. It's when the isomorphism between the representings and the represented breaks down. That's what I can be wrong about. Uh, I can't be wrong about the things that I know immediately, non-representationally, because error is misrepresentation, and I'm not knowing about these things by representing them. Well, how could we put that? Uh, if we think about an example, uh, he uses the, uh, what at any rate became a, a standard 17th century example. I look uh, at the tower in the distance, and it looks square to me. But when I ride closer to it, I realize it's round. But in the distance, I couldn't see the, the depth and see that it was uh, round. Now, I was mistaken about its being square. Uh, I said it is square, and, and it wasn't. Uh, I, said, I said it looks square, though. Well, I wasn't wrong about that. Uh, I can't be wrong about how things look to me. To be wrong is for there to be a difference between how they are, round, and how they look, square. But where I can make a mistake about how things are, I can't make a mistake about how things look or seem. I know how it seemed to me. It seemed to be square in this visual mode of looking. So a way of putting that is that while there is a distinction between being square and seeming perceptually to be square, there isn't a distinction between seeming to be square and only seeming to seem to be square. If it seems to seem square to you, that is its seeming square to you. You can't be wrong about how it looks to you, only about how it really is. So there are these things, how things appear to me, how they look, how they seem, about which we're incorrigible. And again, uh, my appearances are something I know all about. So you say, well, uh, I had an appearance of a speckled hen. And you say, well, how many speckles did it appear to have? And you say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was just speckled. There was no definite number of speckles that it had. You say, well, OK, there, there couldn't be any feature of the appearance that you were ignorant uh, of. So he says, look, here are these things that have the features of representing of pensées, namely appearances, lookings, seemings, what's expressed by statements of how things look, appear, or seem, because well, there's a well, there's a possibility of error in a mismatch between how things are and how they merely appear. There is no such mis mismatch possible or intelligible between how things appear and how they merely appear to appear. Uh, you, you can't turn that crank one more time. Appearings are just the kind of thing that you can't be 
wrong about. So he says, great, I've got a potential foundation for knowledge. There's something you can't be wrong about. The occurrence of representings in you, appearings. Now later on, people would say, oh, you're reifying appearings. You're thinking that there's a kind of thing that is an appearing and laying it alongside the thing that's in the world. And that's true, he was doing that. But uh, there's a coincidence of these two lines of thought. The one about a regress of representings. If anything can be known representationally, something must be known non-representationally. Knowing something representationally is mediated by the representing of it. And so there must be something known immediately, non-representing. And then this observation about what's expressed by talk about how things appear, look, seem, uh, and so on, that we can make a distinction that shows room for error, misrepresentation, between how things appear and how they really are. But there isn't then room for a distinction marking error and the possibility of misrepresentation between how things appear and how they merely appear to appear. Uh, if they appear to appear to you a certain way, that is what it is for them to appear that way to you. OK, so I'm saying these, these things pulled in the same direction, and Descartes, having made this brilliant uh, constructive innovation of <coughs> introducing the notion of representation, thinking about uh, knowledge in representational terms, uh, uh, is driven inexorably to uh, a certain picture of, uh, of the mind as best known to itself, uh, consisting of representings, consisting of appearings uh, in the most basic case. It's against this background that we should understand uh, Seller's analysis of what's expressed by Luke's talk. Uh, the temptation of the uh, sense datum theorists and sort of since Descartes was to say, uh, okay, so just by having these appearings, I know what red looks like. I know what uh, red appearings are, what the appearance of red is, and what it is for, th but that only has to do with my representings, right, with my appearings. Uh, but, but luckily, there's a connection between appearing red, looking red, and being red. Uh, for something to be red is to say it looks red, it would look red, at least if there's no funny business, at least if it's in standard conditions. To call something red, what you're really saying about it is that it would look red. Uh, it would produce red appearings, at least under standard conditions. So there's the prospect of a phenomenalist definition of is red. Phenomenalist because it's in terms of the phenomena, the appearances, the phenomenology uh, of it. Uh, to say what it is to be read in terms of what it is to look read. And it's against this background that Sellers teaches us how looks talk really works and turns that Cartesian line of thought uh, once and for all, I want to say, on its head. Not that everybody noticed that happening, but um, so, so here. Uh, you should look at the passage that starts on page two and really goes through uh, both of these pages. This is the parable of John and the tie shop. Uh, to bring out the essential features of the use of looks, I shall engage in a little historical fiction. A young man whom I shall call John works in a necktie shop. He's learned the use of color words in the usual way, with this exception. I shall suppose that he's never looked at an object in other than standard conditions. As he examines his stock every morning before closing up shop, every evening before closing up shop, 
He says, this is red, this is green, this is purple, and so on. And such of his linguistic peers as happen to be present nod their heads approvingly. Let's suppose now at this point in the story, electric lighting is invented. His friends and neighbors rapidly adopt the new means of illumination and wrestle with the problems it presents, non-standard conditions. John, however, is the last to succumb. Just after it's been installed in his shop, one of his neighbors, Jim, comes in to buy a necktie. Here's a handsome green one, says John. But it isn't green, says Jim, and takes John outside. Well, says John, it was green in there, but now it's blue. No, says Jim, you know that neckties don't change their color merely as a result of being taken from place to place. But perhaps electricity changes their color and they change back again in daylight? Well, that would be a queer kind of change, wouldn't it? I suppose so, but we saw that it was green in there. No, we didn't see that it was green in there, because it wasn't green, and you can't see what isn't so. Well, this is a pretty pickle, says John. I just don't know what to say. <coughs> the next time John picks up his tie in his shop and someone asks what color it is, his first impulse is to say it's green. He suppresses this impulse, and remembering what happened before comes out with it's blue. He doesn't see that it's blue, nor would he say that he sees it to be blue. What does he see? Well, let's ask him. I don't know what to say. If I didn't know that the tie is blue, and the alternative to granting that is odd indeed, I would swear that I was seeing a green tie and seeing that it's green. It's as though I were seeing the, tie, the necktie to be green. If we bear in mind that such sentences as this is green have both a fact stating and a reporting use. Uh, here's another distinction. The reporting use is in presence. When I say in the presence of something green that it's green, uh, the fact stating use I could use maybe as a conclusion of an inference. Uh, so the light is green. How do you know that? Well, look the way the traffic is going. It would, wouldn't be doing that if the light weren't green. That's a fact stating use of the light is green as opposed to a reporting use. Making that distinction, we can put the point I've just been making by saying that once John learns to stifle the report, this necktie is green, when looking at it in the shop, there's no other report about color and the necktie, which he knows how to make. To be sure, he now says the necktie is blue, but he's not making a reporting use of this sentence. He uses it as the conclusion of an inference because there's funny business going on, namely the uh, electric light. We return to the shop after an interval, and we find that John is asked, that when John is asked, what's the color of the necktie, he makes such statements as, it looks green, but take it outside and see. It occurs to us that perhaps in learning to say the tie looks green when in the shop, he's learned to make a new kind of report. So it might seem as though his linguistic peers have helped him to notice a new kind of objective fact, one which, though a relational fact involving a perceiver, is as logically independent of the beliefs, the conceptual framework of the perceiver, as the fact that the necktie is blue. But it's a minimal fact, one which it's safer to report because one is less likely to be mistaken. Such a minimal fact would be the fact that the necktie looks green to John on a certain occasion and it would be properly reported by using the sentence, this necktie looks green. It's this type of account, of course, which I've already rejected. Well, never mind that, he's gonna give us the positive. What's the alternative? If, that is, we don't want to adopt a sense data analysis. Let me begin by noting there seems to be something to the idea that the sentence, this tie looks green to me now, has a reporting role. Indeed, it would seem to be essentially a report. But if so, what does it report, if not a minimal objective fact? And if what it reports is not to be analyzed in terms of sense data? Okay, and here's the positive thought. The suggestion I wish to make is that in its simplest terms, the statement X look green, looks green to Jones differs from Jones sees that X is green in that whereas the latter both ascribes a propositional claim to Jones' experience and endorses it, the former ascribes the claim but does not endorse it. If we skip down, if I make at one time the report X looks green, which is not only a report but the withholding of an endorsement, I may later, when the original reason for withholding the endorsement have been rebutted, endorse the original claim. 
All right. Uh, he's saying, uh, in using the is talk fallibly, the way John could do it before, uh, he's doing two things. He's endorsing the claim that something is green. That you can do in a fact-stating way or a reporting way. To do that, you have to have mastered green talk. You have to know that if it's green, it's colored. If it's green, it means it's not red, and so on. You have to have learned to do all of that. Uh, but you've also learned to do that, not as the conclusion of an inference, but as a response to green things. Exercising a reliable differential responsive disposition to respond to the visible presence of green things by saying, that's green. Now, in the tie shop case, he's learned that there are circumstances under which his disposition to respond to something by, by endorsing the claim green leads him astray. If it's an electric light, that's a systematic source of error, and he can't trust his normally reliable dispositions. So what to do? Well, he could just say, uh, I'm inclined to call it green. I'm disposed to. I'm itching to call it green. My training is giving me this impulse to call it green. But I know that this is electric light, and I know that uh, my dispositions are not to be trusted in this case. So as a responsible uh, uh, knower and agent, I'm not going to endorse the claim that it's green. I'm not going to give in to that temptation. Well, we can introduce a locution for when you're in that situation. When, if you didn't know there was some funny business going on, or didn't suspect it, uh, you would just exercise your reliable disposition to respond to situations like this by saying it's green, endorsing that claim. But because there may be funny business going on, it may not be standard conditions, the conditions under which you're a reliable reporter, you don't do that endorsement. Instead, you express your temptation to call it green, and you explicitly withhold the endorsement. You explicitly do not commit yourself to its being green. Normally, the only way to evince the disposition to manifest overtly the disposition to respond to this thing by saying that, uh, to respond to this uh, situation. Normally, the only way to express that, or before, the only way to express that was to say, was by an endorsement, to say that's green. But once the possibility of funny business has been raised, and you know that under some circumstances, you're systematically not a reliable reporter, we can introduce another way of uh, another response uh, expressing that same disposition. And that expression indicates what the disposition is that you're tempted by and explicitly withholds the endorsement. You say, it looks green. So he says, looks is really an endorsement withholding locution. And its uh, use of green in the looks green uh, uh, idiom is to indicate which disposition to endorse you are withholding which endorsement you're withholding, so which disposition you're resisting by withholding that uh, endorsement. Now notice something about 
this analysis. You say, well, you can be mistaken about whether it is green. Maybe it merely looks green. That is, your response ought to be not to endorse the claim it's green, but to withhold that endorsement while still registering that you're tempted to call it green if you didn't have collateral commitments that told you you couldn't rely on your dispositions, then you would call it green. And you're expressing that, too, but you're withholding the endorsement. But now what would it be to say, well, maybe it doesn't really look green. Maybe you're wrong about that. Well, you've already withheld the endorsement. There's no endorsement that could be mistaken being made there. You couldn't merely see, it, it couldn't be that it merely seems or appears to look green to you, because to say that it seems or appears would be to withhold an endorsement, but you've already withheld the only endorsement that there is. So there's an explanation in this account of why looks talk is incorrigible, why the distinction between is red and merely looks red doesn't iterate, why you can't ask about it's looking red or green, uh, whether it merely appears to look red or green, it merely looks to look red or green. You can't because what you're doing in saying that it looks green is withholding an endorsement already. So there's an explanation here of the Cartesian incorrigibility. But notice that uh, you needed to be able to use his talk in order to be able to use looks talk. You had to be able to make the endorsement, the risky, fallible endorsement that it is green. In order, if you can't make the endorsement, you can't withhold it. So looks talk on this account is essentially practically parasitic on uh, is talk. You can only master looks talk, if the incorrigible looks talk, if you've already mastered the fallible is talk and learned this suburban extension of it. This endorsement withholding account explains the incorrigibility, but it explains it that it's incorrigible in a sense that makes it of no use as a foundation for knowledge. Because you've withheld the endorsement. There isn't any uh, endorsed content to it. There isn't a report of something that you're making. You're expressing a disposition to make a report, but explicitly marking that you're not going to make that report. You're not going to do the endorsement. So I think there are two overlapping questions. Is if that's the understanding of looks talk, seeming talk, could you analyze it in terms of just uh, the other kind of talk that says this looks green, but I may be wrong? Um, is that the same thing? Is that is that an endorsement or something, or is that itself a withholding of an endorsement? And then the other, the relatedly like. In saying that X looks to be green, is there nothing that's being in, nothing at all that's being endorsed by saying that? Because I'm, I'm having trouble understanding how like there's at least a minimal sense in which you're in, you're endorsing the appropriateness of looks talk or well well because there's a difference between saying it looks green and saying it looks red. Mm -hmm. it, the question is. What work is green doing there if it's not describing something? Mm -hmm. You're not describing the thing out there as green because you're withholding the endorsement. Right. And Sellers is saying, don't think of it as the description of some inner thing and appearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, it makes a difference that it's green that it looks and not red that it looks. What's the difference? That's the difference in which disposition are you resisting? Which disposition to withhold? Are you... Uh, resisting. It's the disposition to 
under these circumstances, endorse that it's green. So he thinks it has a, a, a non-descriptive, non-reporting role. It's an essential role, uh, but it's not describing sort of an experience, an appearance, or anything like that. It's sort of marking which uh, commitment you're withholding endorse, which endorsement you're withholding, uh, and saying sort of what the temptation is that you're uh, resisting. So, I mean, in response to your first question, yeah, we could have another locution uh, where instead of just saying it's green, I could say it's green or I'm much mistaken, or it's green but there may be some funny business uh, going on. Uh, now that would be different in that, well, I mean, it depends on how we understand the endorsement uh, of that, whether you can still be held responsible for the consequences of its, uh, of its being green uh, or not. Insofar as, as the, the bit you add is taking it back, it'll be like looks. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I have um, sort of two, yeah, like another two overlapping questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, are you asserting I'm, uh, I have an urge to say this is green, or are you... No, that's not the content uh, of it. Uh, it's not the content of uh, the claim you're making. Uh, it's something you're manifesting. Uh, you're expressing, evincing is the word I use, but what does that really mean? Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, well, he's, he's got another use for that. You're manifesting your disposition to, to uh, commit yourself to it being green, but you've learned not to uncritically manifest that disposition. Sometimes, you know, you don't just do what you feel like doing if there's some uh, uh, collateral commitments uh, going on, and, but you're still uh, uh, yeah, manifesting that same disposition, saying it's a reliable, differential, responsive disposition. You're hooking up a different response to it uh, in the light of collateral commitments that make you think, no, I don't really want to be responsible for, for this claim. I don't really want to endorse it. Uh, so you're going to manifest it in this other way. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so you know, it's, you know, maybe uh, the minister who has learned to say shoot instead of shit. Uh, he's met, you know, gets, gets really angry, but he's, and, and it's somehow important that he's manifesting the temptation to swear. <coughs> but has learned painfully to substitute another expression of it. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated form of life, actually, but, uh, um, but, but a, a response substitution like that is the thought. Okay, yeah, so I'm thinking like, when there's cases like, probably is not a great example here, but something like, say, say there's, a, um, there's a dog way down the street, and, um, and someone's like, uh, and you're walking down the street towards this dog, and uh, your friend says, uh, that looks like a Rottweiler. And you're like, no, it doesn't. Like, what's the disagreement over? I mean, I, th I would translate the no, it doesn't as nobody who was a uh, reliable reporter of Rottweilers under these circumstances would be disposed to endorse the claim that that was a Rottweiler under these circumstances. That's what you're. That's what you're denying. If you're disposed to and having to resist the temptation to call it a Rottweiler, that's because you're not a, a reliable reporter of Rottweilers under these circumstances. That's what you'd be denying. So yeah, less. So maybe. I um, well, why not just have it be the case that you're asserting this thing? Well, why not just have that in have it rather? Because what's the content you're asserting? I, 
have this. Uh, it's just, I, I really want to say it's green. Well, that would be a different a, a different assertion. I mean, one one could that that would be in a sort of pragmatic meta language, and you know, here we only want uh, an idiom that will let John, you know, be a responsible uh, claimer under the circumstances where he's realized that there are circumstances under which he's systematically not reliable, and is at least not sure that those are not. Okay, good. The questions that have just been raised lead right into what I want to ask you. So you've said, you know, it expresses the temptation, it evinces the disposition, it registers it, you've used a bunch of words. You didn't say it represents us as ha it represents me as having the disposition, and now you've explicitly denied that it does that. So here's a question. So if I say, um, this looks red to me, can't Ryan then report to, then tell you that thing looks red to Douglas? And isn't Ryan's, isn't Ryan making an assertion which is <coughs> deferring to what I said and okay. inheriting um, the content from my assertion? So, so I want to claim a number of virtues for this Solarsian uh, uh, analysis, which notice is not. Uh, an argument exactly. It's a persuasive sort of redescription of uh, the phenomenon of you know, the use of the uh, looks talk. And one of them is if uh, Sellers is right about this, then in that third person case, there should be an ambiguity. When, when Ryan says, uh, this merely looks red to Douglas. Uh, is he withholding the endorsement himself and reporting you having said that's red but since he doesn't endorse it he's saying it merely looks red to uh, Douglas or is he reporting you having said uh, it looks red and having withheld it and so he's not claiming that he, he wants us to know that he's not claiming you saw it. Uh, he's only attributing to you the claim that you uh, seem to see, that it looked that way to you. Uh, I think that claim, uh, S, it merely looks red to S, does have that ambiguity, that, that it is properly used in both of those ways and that those are different, and that Sellers is, is able to predict that, uh, that difference. So I don't think there's a sink, I mean, so, so far I'm only subdividing the, uh, subdividing the cases, but uh, it's an ascription, and the withholding of the endorsement can either be inside or outside the scope of the ascribed commitment or withholding of a commitment. So it seems clearly right that there are lots of different situations we can distinguish where it would be appropriate for Ryan to say, um, this looks red to Douglas. But I mean, let's just, um, isn't one of those one where if you say to him, well, how do you know it looks red to Douglas? Um, he says, well, Douglas said this looks red to him. And that just looks like he's deferring. It looks exactly the same as if I said it's raining outside, and then Ryan says. So it, it turns out that you can ascribe withholdings of commitments as well as commitments. Uh, and that's what he's doing in that case. Um, OK. I would have thought that if he says it looks red, this looks red to Douglas, note not it merely looks, mm -hmm. um, he's not ascribing a withholding to me because it could be that um, I said this is red and then he sees that I've said that and thinks, ah, oh, that must look red to Douglas. Um, he's not attributing a withholding to me. I didn't withhold the right. endorsement. But or he would only... But he would say that if he could see that it wasn't red. 
Like, if I saw that it was red, I could still say it looks red to Douglas insofar as he says Even. that it's red. Why wouldn't I? That seems felicitous to say. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, no. okay. Uh, I mean, the mirror is doing yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it is doing work there. Uh, so, I mean, there's a, you know, are you... With the mirror, you're withholding uh, the endorsement. Without the mirror, uh, it's cautious. Is it sort of ambiguous as to whether you're uh, endorsing? You're hedging it in in some way. Uh, still, you know, the claim would be to, to sort of understand how this uh, works. You've got to think about the level of endorsement. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like. Um, so your, your claim was that picking out this sort of ambiguity and what uh, the beliefs are about the reporter of the, lo of the looking, uh, of the reporter of someone else's looking is a virtue of the solar union account because it, it predicts this ambiguity. But I think if, if you're picking out some fact, um, you know, or you know, maybe not fact, but you, you're claiming something that's like, like you are endorsing something when you uh, say it, when you use looks talk, um, uh, then if what you're endorsing doesn't include that, you know, uh, it was read, uh, it, it doesn't include it one way or the other, then um, like it, it seems like that account would also predict that your whether you're committed to its being read or not is indeterminate. So it seems like the accounts are sort of on a par here. Okay, so you're so you're claiming that what I was wanting to um, hold up as confirming the account I'm attributing to uh, mm -hmm. to sellers here uh, is actually explicable uh, on a much weaker reading of what one's doing in the looks uh, case. Yeah, um, could be. Uh, 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 I want to mention some other confirmations, so let's keep track of those too. Uh, so I'm wondering if um, I say, hey Douglas, doesn't her water bottle look green? Uh, I might not be endorsing that the water bottle is green, but am I also, in, but am I in a sense kind of endorsing to, or, or I don't know, giving Douglas some sort of way of understanding what it would be for it to be green, uh, or for me to, to, to endorse that it is green? Am I laying out some sort of... Well, I mean, I think when you say that, you're uh, hedging with holding. You, you have not committed yourself to its being green. Right. Uh, so you're uh, committing yourself, I mean, you're performing inter alia the speech act. It looks green, and sort of asking him to agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that he, he could agree, even if he said, "Well, it is green," and and, and that's why uh, it looks green. That's okay. The, so so look, uh, the the phenomenalist uh, who wants to define what it is to be red in terms of looking red says, "Well, for something out there to be red is just for it to look red, you know, under standard conditions. If we don't do any of this funny business." And Sellers wants to say they're exactly right that that claim, uh, X is red, uh, is equivalent to X would look red under standard conditions. That's true. It's definitionally true. But not because of it's part of the definition of red. It's the definition of standard conditions. The standard conditions are the ones where things are the colors they look, the ones where you don't need to, uh, the ones where there isn't some systematically distorting circumstance, non-standard condition, uh, non-standard in just the sense that your uh, normally reliable uh, responsive dispositions aren't reliable. So, uh, so some of these uh, uh, phenomena that you're talking about are uh, you know, respecting are, are reflecting this definitional relation between looks red and is red. Uh, he's just saying it was a mistake to think it was red that was being defined. It's um, uh, standard conditions that it is. Um, 
I have sort of a, a historic context question. Um, there is a lot of talk here of commitments and endorsements and all this kind of interactive speech act talk. Um, is that something that is traditionally there in this discourse somehow or is that something that was new or did Sellers introduce it? Well, I mean, this notion of endorsement, I think Sellers is uh, okay. uh, is introducing because he's thinking about this all in the public language game, but he's thinking of mm -hmm. in normative terms of rules and mm -hmm. so on. Okay. But, uh, you know, Locke was very interested in what a responsible, respectable um, cognizer, mm -hmm. uh, what commitments they could uh, uh, undertake. Mm -hmm. So, so for instance, it was uh, crucial. Uh, it was a crucial claim of his that um, one was responsible just insofar as one apportioned one's assent to one's evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when you're thinking about whether you know some person is just wild and crazy, or whether they're a responsible, a sort of respectable person, one of it, if it's sort of their claims, knowledge claims that are at issue, you see whether they, his phrase, apportion their assent to their evidence. And this was actually a fairly radical, uh, a, a fairly radical thing, but uh, it was a measure of being epistemically responsible in one's assents. Uh, Descartes is concerned about when you should uh, invest your will in some representation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a notion of endorsement or uh, commitment. I mean, I can't utter four consecutive sentences without using the word commitment, but that's because I'm downstream from uh, yeah. uh, from this. Um, so I, ha I have two things. One was just a suggestion. Um, in response to, uh, for instance, Patrick's question, um, I don't think there's anything precluding you from appealing to some notion of objective looks that's just not to be analyzed in this manner. So when mm -hmm. I say, for instance, to use Charles Travis's example, Pia looks like her sister. Um, that that doesn't. I don't think it's plausible to think I'm in any way uh, uh, expressing a disposition to call Pia uh, her sister. Um, so I mean, I could just be you know report, reporting a, a fact about you know. The objective appearance, visual similarity. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you say that That's looks true. like a Rottweiler, even though I know it's not, you know, I could just be reporting that the dog has properties that Rottweilers typically have. Or, um, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think. I mean, however you want to cash out that notion, I think it's on the table. Even if you want to say, you know. Um, the relevant, I mean, that's not the notion of the looks talk that the uh, okay, traditional now, appearance now, is going to be one appearing of the. To. Uh, Counterexamples uh, to this account. Uh, it, I, I'm interested in, what, in, in whether your notion is going to help. Uh, I mean, I wasn't going to mention this until I had sort of more of the evidence for it uh, in in play. But you know, you go to the doctor and she puts drops in your eyes, and you come back and say, "Well, I can't." drive home from that, why not? Because everything looks blurry. Uh, now, blurry is not a way things could be. Um, that, that, we want to say, is um, sort of specifying something about your vision, uh, that it's blurry. But it seems natural to use looks talk for that. Uh, do you see a connection between that use and she looks like her sister. I, I think the, those are different uses. Those, those yeah, because uh, yeah, I mean, nothing can objectively look blurry. I, 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 I don't but know. But in your, in your I, sense, objective, she could. She she, she just look looks like her sister. I mean, you know, twins look alike. <laughs> I, mean, I don't I don't know. Uh, I, I, it just seems like a different use. I mean, I don't know. Trav, Travis has like a million. You know, when you say it looks like it's going to rain. That's a different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it is. It is a house with many mansions. Yeah. So. so I, and, and there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason sellers, to, to do the work that he needs to mm -hmm. do in the foundationalist thing. He does as you, 
as you said, he doesn't need to deny any of this. He's he's pointing to a use here, yeah. and and there's many others that cluster around it. Um, but uh, oh, uh, okay, you're still. Was, was is, is that, that a finger, finger on the, it's, yes. uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, Good. yeah, so I, I thought of cases like this. I mean, the case I had in mind is if someone spills like paint everywhere and you go up to it, oh, that looks like Winston Churchill. Um, like, you know, obviously you're not disposed to assert that it's Winston Churchill, but you're holding it back. But like, I think in this case, maybe I didn't fill in the details enough, but like, um, but like the Rottweiler case, like, maybe I'll fill in some more details. It's like, oh, well, the dog way down there, but it's so far away that it's hard to tell what it is. I'm going to say it looks like a Rottweiler. Like, it, to all appearances, it looks like, you know, the, the kind of looks talk that's been discussed here and not like the Winston Churchill case or the Pia case. So, like, I mean, I mean, that's, yeah. If, if, I guess if, you're, if, if the move is just to rule out counterexamples by saying to all, to all appearances, well, they look I mean, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have said, Counterexamples, because yeah. as I said, I think, um, you know, Sellers is talking about the uh, the case that, that really matters to him is the one where you're incorrigible about the looks um, be because you've already withheld the endorsement. And the fact that there's lots of, because that's the one that uh, gives us the epistemological temptations to. Uh, you know, think we found an incorrigible foundation for knowledge here because we're misunderstanding the way, you know, what we're doing when we say this. Here, let me get a couple of these other considerations uh, on the table. Um, so, uh, Sellers in uh, 22, in the middle of uh, page four of the handout, points out that. In addition to saying, um, you know, <coughs> it looks as though there's something red uh, uh, over there. Uh, it, it looks as though there's a green tree over there. We can say that tree over there looks green. Uh, what is someone who endorses the sense datum inference? Sense datum inference says, if something looks phi to you, there is something that is phi. It's just the appearance that is phi. What are they going to say about the tree over there looks green? By contrast to, there looks to be a green tree over there. By contrast to, there's a green tree over there. Looks can have a scope. Uh, and Sellers' account is, when you say that tree over there looks green, you're endorsing the claim that there's a tree over there and withholding endorsement from its being green. And that's a perfectly intelligible thing to do. And that's different from withholding endorsement to uh, there being a tree and it's being green. That's what you do when you say there, mere, there looks to be a green tree over there. You're withholding endorsement to the whole thing. So the fact that there can be these different scopes of looks makes perfect sense on the endorsement withholding account and doesn't otherwise. I mentioned the speckled hen, which is a problem for the, as it were, merely speckled hen which is uh, a problem for anyone who endorses the sense datum inference. But never mind that. Uh, if you're flashing figures at me on the tachistoscope, uh, plain figures, uh, and it's a many-sided figure, and I say, well, it looked to have between 30 and 50 sides. Uh, and I say, well, did it look to have 31 sides? No, it didn't look to, did it look to have 32. No, it didn't. It merely looked to have, it looked to merely have between 30 and 50 sides. Now, no figure could merely have between 30 and 50 sides without having either 31 or 32 or whatever. But what am I doing? Uh, 
I'm marking the difference between what I'm willing to endorse and what I'm not willing to endorse in it. Uh, and I'm only willing to endorse uh, a generic uh, claim here. And that makes perfect sense. I'm withholding endorsement from the actual number of sides uh, 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 in this case. Again, how would one make sense of that uh, uh, otherwise? Here's a consideration that uh, makes a, that matters a lot to me, but I don't know whether you'll find it um, uh, compelling. Uh, and this is something that Sellers doesn't talk about. Uh, he waves his hand at the generic lookings. He explicitly mentions the scoped uh, lookings. Uh, this is all on the side of language entry transitions. What about on the side of language exit transitions? Well, there's a Cartesian analog of that. Uh, the distinction that's driving appearance talk and looks talk is uh, the distinction that error involves between it's being green and it's not being green. Uh, and we say, oh, well, but it appears green. It looks to be green. That distinction doesn't iterate. You can't say maybe it merely looks or seems to look. On the output side, the analog of error is failure. And I can say, uh, I put the ball through the hoop, but I could be mistaken about that. I could have failed to put the ball through the hoop. But I can say, but at least I tried to put the ball through the hoop. Say, well, are you sure you succeeded in trying? Maybe you merely tried to try to put the ball through the hoop. No, if I tried to try, that is trying to uh, do it. There's some things that you can't try to do and fail, namely tryings. Those are volitions, acts of the will. What's special about these mental occurrences is that where any other action you try to perform, any external action, you might try and fail, for the volitions that are the tryings, Trying is succeeding. There's no gap between trying and doing. Oh, well, then we've discovered an inner mental realm where not error is impossible, but in this case, failure is impossible. And Descartes, indeed, thinks that there's a domain of uh, volitions, willings, that this is true of, that we have we're not incorrigible, but we have indefeasible dominion over them. Uh, we can do them whenever we want, and we'll never fail to do them. Uh, those tryings, not looks talk, but tries talk now. Uh, and the Salarzian analysis, I think, should be just the same. Uh, trying to do something is not another action, not the most basic case, uh, when I say what I'm trying to do, uh, I'm withholding endorsement from the claim that I succeeded. It's not a factive thing. If I say I merely tried, or I say someone else merely tried, maybe he thought he succeeded, but I say he merely tried, that's marking my withholding of endorsement from uh, the success claim. How Perverse is it then if uh, some moral theorist, say Kant, says the only proper object of moral evaluation is acts of the will. You can't properly morally evaluate anything else, anything where you might try and not succeed. The only thing that we can morally evaluate are these acts of the will and we say, eh, excuse me, you've made a grammatical mistake, that there really are no acts like that. 
the grammar makes it look as though trying to do something is, a, is an action. And I mean, it could be if I say, you know, I tried to solve the equation by plugging this in, you know, by doing this other thing. If trying to do x was doing y in an attempt to succeed at doing x, in that case, there can be a real doing. But the acts of the will, those pure tryings, as it were, the minimal ones, that the picture is, have to be producing all the external things. Those are as uh, uh, are fantasies in the same way that appearances are, appearings are. So I find that uh, line of thought about volitions uh, equally compelling as uh, the line of thought about mere lookings. Uh, and I take that to be a kind of confirmation of uh, the uh, correctness of the analysis that Sellers is giving here. Now, I pitched this saying uh, there are some uh, philosophical achievements or moves that you should take as exemplary and say, yes, what I aspire to is to make a move like that. And I want to say uh, that this turning of the Cartesian line of thought on its head, uh, saying, uh, yes, you were perfectly right about the incorrigibility of statements about how things merely look or seem or appear. But when you really understand that, the way I'm going to explain the source of that incorrigibility, you see why uh, it's precisely unsuited to do the job that you wanted it to do, to be a foundation for knowledge, to be the source of all of our evidence uh, about uh, things. You're perfectly right that red things look red under standard conditions is true by definition. You're right about that. But it's not a definition of is red in terms of looks red. It's a definition of standard conditions. It's true by the definition of standard conditions. The very thing that the Cartesian tradition, and you know, not just Descartes now, all these 20th century foundationalists, this is going to the heart of empiricism as, a found, as an epistemologically foundationalist uh, program, uh, all of them were systematically misunderstanding the relation between looks talk and is talk, thinking of looks talk as an autonomous stratum of language, as expressing things, concepts you could grasp before you've grasped is read. Uh, so that we could understand is read in terms of them, semantically foundational, and things you could know to be true, even though you knew nothing of the form X is read. And yet, uh, when we understand how it's really working, we see that the capacity to use is, uh, to use looks phi talk is parasitic on the ability to use is phi talk. You have to already be able to do the risky <laughs> claims that might be wrong uh, with the is phi talk in order to be able to withhold those endorsements and use the, the looks phi talk. This, it seems to me, is just a fabulously enlightening sort of turning of the tables on this 300-year-old uh, tradition. Uh, and there is simply no uh, antecedent to this. There isn't some earlier philosopher who had uh, sort of this analysis of the relation between his <coughs> talk and looks talk. This was Sellers' uh, idea. And of course, it's hard to know what having another idea like that would, uh, would be. But that's <coughs> you know, the thing I'm saying. That that's what we're all aspiring to, is to make a move like this. And uh, Though in many ways it got buried in here, the uh, myth of the given, that he was fighting the myth of the given, that's famous. 
this understanding of looks talk not so much. Uh, and uh, it, it really goes to the, to the heart of this um, uh, dominant philosophical tradition. So that's what I, what I was calling the, uh, the sort of the main event in here. If you got nothing else out of reading this essay than, than this move, it would be enough. It's worth the price of admission. Um. Uh, so one sort of feature of Seller's account that you're at least implicitly claiming is dispensable, um, but some of the things you seem to say seem to contradict with some of the things he says here. So I mean, he, I mean, one word that doesn't show up uh, intentionally in your reconstruction of the account is experience. Um, so I mean, what Sellers says is. Uh, the suggestion I wish to make is that the statement X looks green to Jones differs from X. Jones sees that X is green, whereas the latter both ascribes a propositional claim to Jones's experience and endorses it. The former ascribes this claim to the experience, but does not endorse it. Um, so there the account seems to be, well, so we have, I mean, the, the kind of the end, we think of experiences uh, as potentially comp containing claims, and you can ascribe a claim to an experience. Um, now, normally, when you say, I, I see that X is green, I'm ascribing the claim and endorsing it in you know, sort of a single act, I think, is the thought um, that my experience contains this claim and X is green. Uh, so I endorse the claim as well. Whereas when I uh, say uh, X merely looks green, I'm merely sort of ascribing the claim to my experience without endorsing it. Um, now, I mean, that doesn't show up in the right. account. Right, uh, so, intentionally, but um, I was wondering. I mean, you're, you're quite right. That. The, the Sellers wants to talk about a common descriptive content that's in play in both uh, in both of these, and will uh, <coughs> tell different try try out different stories about this for the rest of his life uh, about. Uh, how to talk that way. Uh, what we get in the second half of the essay, the account of sense impressions, gives us a reading of that. That is, we're going to get a causal explanation of why it is that uh, I'm tempted to make these mistakes under non-standard circumstances, and uh, what it is that's common to the two cases. Uh, there are similar sense uh, impressions similar in the uh, red star uh, sense that he'll give uh, 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 to that, similar in the way sense impressions uh, can be. The, the question, of course, is how the occurrence of those particulars is to be understood to be related to some descriptive content that's common to these things. Uh, here he just says there are both of those in play. And I left the descriptive content out of the story because I don't think it does any work uh, in the story. Uh, the, the reason it's there is not to do work in the story but to be true to our experience. Um, and you know, you're not, he's not alone and you're not alone in uh, thinking that there is some work there to be done. Uh, this is the, uh, the point on which uh, McDowell's reading and mine of EPM begin to diverge, uh, where I think uh, those remarks about the shared descriptive content do no work, so ignore them. Mm -hmm. uh, and he thinks that uh, apart from this anti-foundationalist argument, which, do, which we agree does not require uh, uh, this feature of the account, but that sort of being true to our uh, perceptual experience or something, it's hard for me to put this in neutral terms, but um, uh, that there is other uh, descriptive work to be done by those uh, by those remarks. Now, uh, John agrees that you know, we don't get any cash for that here and agrees that Sellers tries out 
different ways of making sense of that later on, how uh, eventually sensa are involved, and neither John nor I want to think about Wilfred on sensa. Um, so there, what he invokes in his a priori refutation of quantum mechanics from his own <laughs> chair. Uh, he, he knows a priori that quantum mechanics cannot be right because sensa. Um, not not going there, but but John thinks that these uh, that what that Sellers is after something important here, uh, and that even though he didn't successfully sort of catch it, it can successfully be caught. And uh, uh, John has offered uh, ways of making sense of that. So that should be that should be acknowledged. And I put in the readings for this week uh, a couple of the McDowell things that uh, uh, push on this. So, uh, um, so yes, that's, that's well taken. There's, real, there's a real issue there. Uh, why don't we take 15 minutes uh, now, come back a quarter after.